you. So uh, we are really excited that you guys are joining us. Uh, I'm Natalie Bishop and uh, Holly Mabry, we are presenting together. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And as I'm doing that, um, I've noticed that there are so many different types of libraries that are joining us today. So just to set the stage, um, our library, we're um, a small institution, a small university, um, and our library serves uh, from undergraduate up to the doctoral level, but we're still not the size of a state institution. But the things that we're going to talk about today can be flexed up to a much larger library or library system or dialed down to its collection that uh, may be smaller than ours. Um, so it is very, very flexible. And I encourage you guys to think about this uh, presentation and make notes through the lens of your institution so that you can walk away uh, with things that you can apply to your own libraries. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I'm gonna click us over into present mode. So uh, thank you for joining us. This is right size, not downsized, weeding for quality over quantity. Um, and so as we think about what is right sizing, it's this totally different word than weeding. Um, and we found the word right sizing in Suzanne Ward's book, Right Sizing the Academic Library. And when we read this quote, removing decades of obsolete material and ongoing and routine evaluation of activities that keep a collection fresh and relevant. Um, that is something that really resonated with us. Um, and we thought, oh, like that is what we are doing. We are not weeding, which has this kind of negative yucky feel, even though like we like to use it in house in the library. Um, we needed a word and an ideology that really embraced what we were trying to do because this wasn't about getting stuff out the door as much as making sure that we had a collection that really reflected the needs of our users. So um, why do we right size? And um, one of the things that got this started was I was actually weeding the uh, computer science collection because technology changes so rapidly. So that is a subject area that needs to be weeded frequently in general. But I found out that uh, just by glancing that the main collection had never been weeded. And the majority of our physical collection was purchased in the 50s, 60s and 70s. There was something about um, textbooks back then and multiple copies. Faculty and student feedback on our physical co collection in general was negative because there was, while there was good new stuff, there was a lot of older materials that were hiding the newer stuff. And then there wasn't much alignment between the physical collection and the current curriculum. So what we did was um, I was actually researching in our discovery service of some topics related to weeding and stumbled upon this book that we read. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Natalie to um, go a little bit more about the book. So um, the book is called Right Sizing the Academic Library Collection. Um, and this cover that's on this slide is actually for the second edition, which is in pre-order right now. Uh, but we read the 2014 uh, edition of the book. What really was cool about uh, the plan that was laid out in this book is that it was easily modified to fit the needs of our library. So we didn't just take the plan and follow it directly, but we really kind of modified it to fit our needs. And it was an ideological shift away from this title by title review, um, which is incredibly time consuming um, as a weeding process to a more streamlined approach. Now, weeding, whether it's more streamlined or title by title is a significant time commitment, but this helped us be a little bit more efficient um, with our approach. And it also allowed us to see that we needed to add books to our collection um, in a way that was meaningful and curriculum driven rather than uh, an older mindset where um, we added books to have representative coverage of a topic or an idea when it may not be part of the landscape of what we're studying here at our institution. So part of this uh, plan, we can't just like you know, 
bust into a right sizing project or a weeding project without first laying some foundations. Um, so we really felt like we needed some professional development to get us started. Um, we had no budget for professional development. So whatever we did was gonna have to be homegrown, um, which is a little bit scary because homegrown professional development can be expensive in its own way uh, because it can take up a lot of time. So um, Holly had found the right sizing book and we decided to keep it simple. Um, we did a, a group read. We, we read one chapter each week. There's only five chapters in the book. Not sure about the new one, but at least the 2014, there were five chapters. Um, then each week we had practical discussions um, where we thought about, let's think about these ideas and these processes and how we might take action on these items. We also had some reflective writing that we would do because different members of our team uh, felt more comfortable speaking aloud in a group and other ones felt more comfortable using a reflective writing process. Um, as we went through this professional development together, um, we really found that we had a wide spectrum of weeders in our um, librarian group. Uh, some of us were really aggressive weeders, other people were more holistic, and then we had some of us that were what I call keepers. They, their tendency is to keep things. Um, and so this allowed us just to build a good foundation and establish common goals that despite the fact that we may have this difference in weeding profile that we fit into, um, we all needed to um, fit within a common framework that may be a little uncomfortable to our personal style, but it allowed us to accomplish this goal. The last piece is we did take the time to draft out and write out a plan. Um, this was really important. Um, and we did it because the book said to, but it was a great thing because we had administrators who then came back to us and were like, um, could you articulate this a little bit more? Could you explain where you're coming from? And we were able to like say, hey, here's our plan and here's our policy. It explains everything. Um, and they really, um, that resonated with our administration a lot um, and won us a lot of support. It also, this process of planning and creating allows us to assign specific roles within the library for who's gonna accomplish what, and then identify benchmarks so that we can have both long-term and short-term success stories. So the right sizing plan, this all started um, probably about three years ago when I did the computer science and then we got the professional development off the ground. So what we had to do was um, adapt our a right sizing plan to what works in our library. And some of our goals were to bring more visibility to current content, which as I mentioned, um, was pretty covered up by the older content in our physical collection. We wanted to improve user experience and browsability as well. And then um, in the end, we'd like to repurpose library space to create more inviting student-centered atmosphere. And so that will include um, moving, uh, taking away some sections and moving in more furniture and rearranging and adapting the library for more current needs. So what we um, had were three different types of right sizing approaches, multiple wave, right sizing and rule space and then matching our print collection to electronic to decide whether one or the other was more useful for our collection. And we started with the multiple wave, which basically is um, the ones that we could decide more quickly. And this was VHS tapes, cassette tapes, um, duplicates, and they were more decisions we, made it point to connect with the community or to faculty members who were involved in this, but we were able to work these through the system pretty quickly. And then the right sizing and rule space, that is more the system space. So whatever your ILS is, ours is WMS, 
we were able to pull the number of checkouts that we've had um, over time and we could match that up and send it to faculty. And then um, again, lastly, the um, print to electronic involved our books and our journals primarily. So the multiple wave approach, and that, as I said, that was the remove the outdated formats, such as the cassettes and VHS. And we also deduplicated many of the sections and addressed the books that were in poor condition. So we had, uh, we have a good many books that are at least, you know, with say 75 to 100 years old that are falling apart. And we were able to address whether we need to, to rebind them or repair them or replace them. You want to click on the. Yeah. So this is our plan. We use Google Docs because it's a collaborative approach and our staffing has changed over the years. So we've added or adapted the staff assigned to the different sections. And what we've done is assign the different liaison librarians to areas that they either specialized in or had some connection to. Um, for example, Natalie did education and political science, and I've done computer science and some business and then literature, which are um, some of my big areas. And then we had the staff members help with some of the multiple wave approaches with the deduplication and the VHS removals. We were able to bring in student workers to help with that as well. And then um, also with the processing with withdrawing the books um, once they were finished. So this document has stayed here for the last three to four years that we've had this project going and we've been able to go back to it and constantly edit and change it as we need to. So the next phrase approach uh, that we took kind of springboarding off that document that Holly just walked you through a moment ago is the right sizing and rules based approach. Um, and this was uh, what we just in house called the content weed, uh, where we're actually weeding the content of the collection and trying to align it to our current academic curriculum. In this stage, this is where bringing in our faculty as stakeholders was really essential. Um, while a lot of us in the library have advanced degrees in other subject areas, uh, we do not have the full spectrum of the LC subject headings covered in our building. Um, so there was a, a lot of areas where um, we had some experience, but not a really good foundational knowledge base, um, not the way that an expert in the field has. So we really needed to employ our faculty and say, hey, um, contribute here. And most of our faculty were really excited about that process. Um, we asked them some of the nerdy stuff uh, that they never get to talk about with people, um, like who are the key theorists in your area? Tell me about the seminal researchers that you feel are important for what you study. Um, what are some essential texts in your discipline? Um, and they were really excited about sharing that information. So um, we started out with those lists of uh, key theorists, seminal researchers and texts that our faculty provided to us. Then we started to leverage our ILS. As Holly mentioned earlier, we use WMS as our um, ILS system. So what we would do is have our cataloging and systems librarian, he would pull um, reports out of WMS for that section that we were working on. Then we would break those sections apart in different ways um, and then run those uh, theorists, those researchers, and those key texts through those spreadsheets so that we could start identifying these are definite keepers versus here's stuff that we need to consider whether or not we want to keep it or get rid of it. Um, it eliminated that practice of uh, having to touch every single book unless it was a discipline where uh, we were extremely knowledgeable because we had our own uh, degree in that area. So just a brief overview of my right sizing process. 
Since I did multiple sections, each section was very different. So for example, business has several different sections. So I ended up splitting that with our systems librarian and I did the marketing and communications. So I identified the faculty that are that teach in those areas specifically and was able to contact them and say, hey, do you still use these in your classrooms? And I think it was really helpful to be able to contact those people that work directly with that content. And it gives a better sense of how our materials are related to the um, curriculum. And then if we need to update it, we can do that. And for literature, that one is more, um, the department decided to review a list, a whole list of books um, at their departmental meeting, and that's once a month. And then I also had um, sports and recreation. Uh, they would rather do a more blanket approach, which in this case, they said, you can remove anything before 1995. And that was actually a lot of the material in that section um, for the sports and physical education part. In general, um, I feel like I've kind of opened up a can of worms here because I tend to um, I'll work on something and then see another project that emerges from it. And in this case, the um, we had an issue where some of our literature books were cataloged in the PZ section because I think that was a call number system used for fiction or that was supposed to be more easily accessed somehow. But in our case, it was better for those books to go in the traditional LC call number so that they'll be more uh, browsable. The other part of the literature section, and I'm currently working on this now, is pulling out all of the popular fiction. As an academic library, we kind of have, we tend to focus more on curriculum, but we do have some popular fiction. And so we'd like to create a dedicated space for that, as well as other more trending reads, just to give students a chance to come in the library and use those particular materials. A lot of people don't really know we have them. So my right sizing process, uh, it has some commonalities with Hollings, uh, but I'm going to focus on some of the parts that are a little bit different just to give you a sense of some of the different ideas that have been employed in our right sizing process. So um, one of the first things that I did for both the education section, which is the L's and political science, which is the J's, um, was that multiple wave approach. So we got rid of the duplicates, we got rid of the outdated formats. Um, so things that were um, easy, you know, decisions, we could go ahead and have some early wins in the process. Um, then I decided to sit down with my faculty and my faculty profile looked different for these two different subject areas, but we sat down and we created the rules that um, we wanted to employ for those areas. So some of the rules for that rules based approach, uh, we decided to leave everything from 2000 to the present alone. Um, we weren't even going to think about weeding that stuff. We're going to catch it in a future weeding cycle. So we knew that there were at least 20 years worth of books um, that we weren't going to evaluate those right now. We'll deal with that later. We're going to deal with the older stuff. We also sat down and collaborated on that list of theorists and seminal researchers. So that way we had that shared list of saying, hey, these things are always important to us no matter what their age might be. Um, we also thought about it in terms of circulating statistics. So um, my faculty in both groups felt like if something had uh, five or more circulating um, statistics, that uh, that was something that we would leave on the shelf for now and then see what happened with that title in a future weeding cycle. But um, those three sets of rules um, gave us some really good parameters to operate in. So for education, uh, because that uh, program area dealt with both undergraduate and graduate studies, 
um, we decided to put together a small committee with faculty representatives from both uh, branches of the undergraduate and the graduate programs. So I had two undergraduate faculty and two graduate faculty. Um, that way, uh, we weren't looking at the weeding process through one lens or the other, uh, but we were kind of looking at it in a collaborative way so that we made sure to meet the needs of both programs. Um, we would share a Google spreadsheet back and forth uh, to identify what was going to be kept versus what was going to go away. Um, in education, I used a more hands-on process. Um, so that's what my doctoral degree is in. So I felt like I could work more quickly in the stacks than I could off of the WMS report. So I already had a really good sense of what to pull as initial um, candidates for weeding versus um, what was really important and should stay. I still used our inventory system to generate a list of those books that were pulled and shared those with the faculty for additional input. Now for political science, I took a slightly different approach. I do not have a degree in political science. This is not my field of study. Um, I have worked with these faculty really closely for the last five years, um, but that doesn't a degree make. So um, I decided to uh, really rely more heavily on the expertise of those faculty members. Um, so in this case, we started with the reports from WMS. Um, we had our systems librarian, he pulled those reports for us. Um, I organized it by decades and I would send my faculty a decade at a time for their feedback. Um, we did go ahead and run through those spreadsheets to eliminate uh, theorists the last 20 years and five or more circulating checkouts uh, just so that we were only focused on the things that were candidates for weeding. Um, I'm going to share that spreadsheet just so you can get a sense of what that looked like. Um, we did use Google Sheets just because it was an easy collaborative document to share with our faculty. Um, the things that are highlighted in yellow are things that we decided, yes, we're going to keep. We also made notes on the side to identify why this text or why this author might be important. Um, and most of these came from my faculty. Um, and you can see they really got into it, uh, explaining you know, what their thoughts are on some of these books. Um, now, not every faculty member uh, became this excited, but what was super great about this process is that now I have these notes that otherwise you know, I don't think that Dr. Amato and I would have sat down and talk about talked about, uh, you know, the constitutional dictatorship crisis government in the modern democracies um, over coffee one day. I mean, we sit down and talk about other things over coffee, but probably not this. Um, but I now have this additional insight into this book because of her note that um, it's something that I might use in a future class one day, or as I'm doing a research consultation with a student, um, this piece of knowledge may come into play. So this type of additional relationship uh, with faculty is also really important. And that was an unexpected but really positive consequence um, of this process. Um, I also will say we agreed upon um, our color coding system before we got started so that that way uh, we were all following the same uh, highlighting rules um, as we were going through these documents. So um, when we actually used WMS um, and scanned our books, we used a app called Digby and it's available on Android or Apple. And it produces, and you can inventory or search the catalog um, or WMS uh, directly through your Digby. And I usually would pull an abbreviated spreadsheet report at the time that I could scan the books using my phone. If you need a more comprehensive report, which is what Natalie used, um, you would rely on the inventory report. Just thought I'd mention that um, just as an aside. But um, one of the things we are also doing as part of our process is 
we're matching our in a lot of cases we found that we had multiple copies of electronic books and print books so we may have two or three electronic versions and then one or two print versions the key here is to identify okay is this an online program or is this a program that is primarily face-to-face -face? because we have a um, degree completion program that is predominantly online whereas our traditional undergraduates are residential and then our graduates are mostly online but we also have some residential students so that was a factor to take into play as well once we decided what kinds of books to choose because we needed to know um, whether they could get access to them or not um, in this way. So that was part of that one. Part of uh, what we also wanted to look at with this was uh, matching our journals against our electronic holdings also. Um, when we first started the right sizing process, uh, we were primarily focused on our uh, book collection. Um, but as we sort of hit our stride uh, right sizing our book collection, we were like, okay, now we're ready to start thinking about our journals. Um, and so we decided to start identifying um, journal like bound in microfilm and microfiche journals um, that could be withdrawn from the collection based on several key criteria. Um, we looked at first at, um, you know, short runs, scattered holdings, and dead journals uh, to see what uh, didn't fit the curriculum and could probably go. Uh, we also compared it to stable platforms that we subscribe to as well. Um, so thinking about uh, a community friendly book removal is part of the right sizing process. So as I said earlier, uh, right sizing your collection is not about how many books you can get out the door. It's not about the quantity of things you keep versus the quantity of things that you get rid of. But at the end of the day, you still have to think about this last leg of the journey and how are you going to close that loop. And it's really important, important to have a well articulated, a written community friendly book removal plan in place. Um, so with your plan, think about a couple of things um, that benefit you as a library and also can benefit your community. Um, so as part of our removal plan, we decided to prioritize um, how are we going to handle this process, not just physically, uh, but things actually getting out the door. And we decided to our first wave is to consider a for profit option when we're getting rid of our books, then whatever is left after the for profit option, um, we look at what are some community support options. So how can these books support our wider community. And then last but not least, um, anything that's left over after those first two waves, um, that does have to go to recycling. So um, we get asked a lot, why are you so interested in a for-profit option? Um, our library does not have a book budget. Um, we have not had a book budget in the last 10 years, and more and more both academic and um, other libraries are facing that reality that book budgets are not just being cut, but they're being eliminated. And so we're having to find alternate ways to uh, supplement our uh, print collections so that we can buy newer content that aligns to our curriculum and meets the needs of our community. Um, so we look for a wholesale bookseller um, where we could get lists of what the bookseller would like and then we send those items on to the bookseller and then we accrue money with them. Now it's not just uh, fun money that we get to spend it on you know Amazon or through other book vendors. Um, we do have to use that money with that bookseller, but we have found that at least like 85% of the time um, that bookseller does carry the titles that we would like to purchase. So it's a really good uh, turnaround. It's also a really simple and easy process. And we're able to buy the content that our students and our faculty need.
Um, we also have looked at Friends of the Library book sales and, um, you know, some of those other types of options as well. We also run a couple of fundraisers throughout the, the year that also adds to our book budget a little bit, but um, using the wholesale book seller option is uh, the main way that we supplement our um, library budget for purchasing new books. So free books. Lately, um, we have been hosting several subject specific giveaways. The most um, most recent would be music. And we just uh, set up several carts, socially distanced, of course, in the main area of the library and just offered the music scores or music books that we did not need anymore. It was an opportunity for the community or faculty or staff or students to come in and pick out what they wanted. We've also done fairly large scale giveaways for divinity. And we actually had someone who was starting a new divinity um, school library and they took, it was at least five or six carts worth of books. So we were able to help them out um, as well. So it was kind of a win-win for all. And we're also looking at um, doing literature and other subject areas as well. So this has been a really successful uh, venture in um, at least bringing in the community there. And our last stop is recycling. And when I look at this whole process from selecting the book to weeding for weeding all the way down to we need a bunch of boxes to put the books in because um, we have to pack them up to recycle them. It's really overwhelming and it feels like drinking from a fire hose. But I also see that it's very unifying because we have staff, it, staff, community, faculty, um, Garden Web communities, faculty and students all involved in the process from the selection to the recycle process. And so in our case, um, any books that have, or older textbooks that are outdated and have content that is not um, appropriate for use, we um, recycle those. Or um, any books that are in terrible condition that we've been able to replace. And, and this is probably our last, um, last stop once we've done all of our due diligence with the Better World Books and the um, book, book giveaways. We've also, for the journals, um, we have put those out on several library listservs um, to see if there are other libraries that would like our bound or microfilm or fiche uh, journals. And so we're actually in the process now of sending uh, quite a large collection to several libraries, uh, both within our region and uh, further up the East Coast. So we're able to help out other libraries as well, which is great. Um, and then some of our children's books, like the big, big books, um, we've actually been able to send those uh, to a couple of our local elementary schools so that um, their teachers have some of the big books and our student teachers uh, at Gardner-Webb who are working in those schools um, have big books to practice with uh, when they're reading to their classrooms. So uh, that's also been a really uh, fun community thing that we've been able to do. So as a, at this point, but in the last, since March, 2020, and we did a lot of our weeding between, uh, during the, when the pandemic started and um, the, lab, the school went virtual to virtual instruction. So we have weeded in the last 12 months, over 30,000 books. We've earned roughly 1,100 books from Better World Books. And we have used a good majority of this to purchase new books. So in all in all, if you don't count what we've added back, this is a 25% reduction in the quantity of materials that we have. And like we said in our title, it's more a quality over quantity. So we're also adding while we're and learning more while we're weeding. 
And we've had really good responses from our faculty and um, our students in some of the areas that have been completed. Um, and that has been a really rewarding part of the process um, because we're seeing areas and collections within the library actually get some use, whereas before stuff just sat there. And that's really what we want. We want people to use what we have and to be contributors, contributors to our community. So just some key takeaways, just to kind of cycle back through um, a couple of essential things. Um, if you guys are thinking about starting a right-sizing project at your library, um, just remember to onboard your team. Um, that is time really well spent that will benefit you in the long run. And to think holistically about the project. Um, it is really easy uh, to think about weeding a certain section or this collection of here, but right sizing really is thinking holistically about the entire library collection and how that impacts your community. Um, and then create a plan. Make sure that whatever you decide to do, whether it's um, a small right sizing project or big, um, just make sure that it's well articulated and mapped out because people will ask and what they're really interested in is what is your end game and why? And, um, you know, they're usually okay with your journey and getting there, but that's also how you can get people involved and win over stakeholders. Um, and finally, all the planning in the world is for nothing if you don't take action steps. Um, it's really good to have a timeline and benchmarks, um, but also remember to be realistic and flexible with yourselves. Um, but I also say be firm because uh, I know what it's like. You say, this is my deadline for this thing, and you get there and you don't meet it. So you push it back a little bit. Next thing you know, a year has passed. Um, so I would say be, be firm also. Um, and then make sure that you make lists about which decisions uh, fall firmly within the camp of, hey, this is our professional zone as librarians. We are knowledgeable and enabled people um, and have a professional degree to make decisions. And then also when decisions involve external stakeholders from the library. And Holly really said it best. Um, this is a library-wide initiative. It's going to take your entire team, not just your librarians, but it will take everyone. Um, so having smooth workflows and good communication is essential. And it's okay if you have to adjust your workflow or adjust um, how you choose to communicate. Uh, just make sure that it includes everyone. And then uh, we'd like to open the floor uh, for any questions that you guys have. Uh, okay. My and Holly's contact information is here also if you would like to email later. Okay, um, thank you both very much. I do have a few questions here in the chat, so I'm gonna get started. Um, I like that you included discussion and reflective writing. How many staff does your library have and did everyone participate in the reading the book and developing the plan? That's a really good question. Um, we have six librarians and um, all of our librarians participated in the reading. Um, at the time, we only had four librarians. So I think it was just the four of us. And then since then, we have hired two new librarians. So we plan to do a rereading of the book um, so that they can join in as well. Um, but really looking back, and I'm glad that you've asked that question, um, this probably should have been a library wide read uh, since it involved everyone. And we'll probably look at that for our next uh, read of the book when the new edition comes out. Okay, thank you. Next question. It was stated that one of the parameters used was to check for five or more circulations of the items. Over what time period? Holly, I'll let you answer that one. Hey, um WMS will track the um, st timestamp statistics since we got it in 2015. Um, and we, but we can also see how many times that the item has been circulated of all time. And if it just has a timestamp, I mean, if it has the number of checkouts, but no timestamp, that means that it had been checked out sometime between 1997 when we got our first ILS um, until when we got WMS in 2015. So generally we try to look at, okay, has it been checked out a lot of times? 
over, was it te checked out 20 times back in 1997 or sometime before 2015? Or what has it been checked out more recently in the last uh, five years? And so as long as it, like we really looked at how many times it had been checked out and had a, you know, a circulating within the last few years, particularly. Okay, um, the next two questions I think could go together. So I'm gonna kind of combine them. Um, would you be willing to share a list of the wholesale booksellers you use? And next question, how do you purchase books if you have no bu book budget? So uh, the wholesale bookseller that we use is uh, Better World Books. And um, you can, if you just Google Better World Books, they lay out their entire process on their website. Uh, you can create a free account. And then um, as you send things to them, uh, then you accrue funds through your account. Um, and the way that we purchase books without a book budget, um, we just have a list of things that uh, have been requested and um, we try to do the best that we can. We try to purchase as much as we can with our Better World book funds. Um, and then everything else we uh, purchase through um, some of our fundraisers that we have. Um, like we have an annual um, art sale that we participate in at the university. Um, and then we usually have every year um, a couple of gifts and donations. Um, usually that runs somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand dollars total. Um, but sometimes we have things that we're just not able to purchase and we have to wait until the next fiscal year uh, where we've got um, another bump in um, gifts. So, okay. Um, two more questions. Um, the first one, did you get any pushback on your right sizing project? So far, I have not from any of my departments. Uh, mostly there's a sense of um, shock and horror, especially when we share that VHS tapes were still sitting on the shelves when we first got started. Um, and most of my faculty have been really appreciative of us taking um, these steps. Um, Holly, do you want to share from your areas? Uh, there have been some um, professors that would say, why would you take this off the shelf? Um, or could we have it for our departmental library? Um, and so um, I think that was just a matter of explaining, okay, we're not just throwing it out the door. We're actually offering it to you if you want to keep it either for your personal use or for departmental use. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a last question and we'll maybe take a couple more if you have any. Um, what are some end goal suggestions do you feel would be necessary for public libraries? I would say um, with a public library, that's not a space that I've um, worked in professionally, but I do have uh, friends in the public sector that um, I do talk with them quite a bit. Um, some of the things that they have mentioned as concerns are, um, you know, uh, making sure that their spaces are inviting and that their uh, content is visible. And so um, while their process is a little bit different than ours, um, I think that end goal of making sure that the newer content is um, visible and accessible to patrons that come in the door. Um, also, just making sure that um, your space is friendly and inviting. I think that's something that we all um, see as the end goal because uh, that's something that my public library friends have brought up as well. Um, you may even want to form a team at, um, at your library that involves some of your patrons and your community members uh, to see what they would like to see out of a right sizing um, initiative, if it's more uh, space driven, or um, if there's newer content that they would like that you don't have, or, um, you know, how they feel about the collection as a whole. Um, like I said, we included our faculty and staff initially through a survey, and that's how we found out um, they had really negative perceptions about our collection um, and about our space. And so uh, we started with those conversations um, and sort of built our end game from there. Okay, one more question came in. Um, do you have any concerns about materials that you might have in both digital and hard copies like journals when keeping items? 
as you might lose access to the digital copies due to budgetary or database changes? That is a really good question. Um, and that's a conversation that we actually had recently. Um, so with our journals in particular, um, we identified, uh, so we uh, just did a fundraising initiative so that we were able to purchase uh, JSTOR. Um, that has been a dream at our library um, for the last 20 years. I'm really not kidding. Um, and it was a campus-wide fundraising initiative within the departments. Uh, to be able to purchase JSTOR. Like departments actually pledged um, their own departmental funds for us to be able to make that purchase. So um, it was a huge skin in the game moment. But um, we now have JSTOR and that is a stable platform that we will always be able to keep and maintain. Um, we also identified uh, APA psych articles as another uh, stable database that we will maintain and um, academic search complete and um, ATLA, which is the um, uh, American Theologian um, uh, database. So those four databases, we know we will continue to purchase no matter what. And so uh, uh, journals that were fully represented in those four journals, um, we felt safe and comfortable letting go of the print copies because we knew that those journal platforms would remain stable to our library. So um, I would just sit down and think about, here are my databases, which ones are we gonna commit to perpetual access to? Um, and then start from there. Okay, one last question here. Um, I liked that you were able to obtain notes from the faculty on the spreadsheet. Can you give me any tips on gaining faculty buy-in or building relationships with faculty, especially since most everything is still virtual? That's really good. Um, so that particular department, uh, one faculty member I was already good friends with because we had collaborated on different things over the last five years. The other faculty member I didn't know as well. So um, I asked uh, Dr. Amato, I was like, you know, I don't know Dr. Delahante quite as well. So uh, while you guys have your departmental meetings, um, could you help kind of plug this for me, help me make that connection. Um, because like you said, we're in this uh, COVID world where things are a little bit more removed um, and we have to access people digitally. Um, and so she was really instrumental in uh, helping me make that connection with Dr. Delahante. Um, so that's something that I've also done is just try to leverage the faculty relationships that I had built pre-COVID to um, build some newer ones in a post-COVID world because they still had close contact, whereas um, I'm removed by the digital divide that hopefully will go away <laughs> when uh, things with COVID start to turn around for us. Okay, oh, um, looks like there's anything. Um, are there any concerns in terms of accessibility when it comes to right sizing? We Holly, have I have different- you answer that one. We have different formats of the same book and multiple copies and such as large print books on CD through Overdrive, Hoopla and online apps. You want me to answer that one? Yeah, since you're our um, universal design expert, so. Um, well, one of the things we look at is whether any, like eBooks can be offered in multiple formats such as EPUB or PDF. And we, if we need the access for say a searchable PDF, then we can use our um, disability office. Um, we actually, with the print books, with one of the benefits of our right sizing process is that we've been able to make the collection itself more accessible because we're taking books off the top and bottom and spacing them out a little bit more so that people can move around better. Um, and the books that we're taking out that are both print and ebooks are typically older editions that are not being used on the print level at all. So. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going to close for time and I will let Tiffany take it away.